scaly, red, itchy skin. Many people call this eczema, but the reality is this really is a misnomer. Today, almost any skin rash is referred to as eczema and has become a general term for almost any type of dermatitis or inflammation of the skin. Because the term is so broad and can mean a whole family of skin conditions, it can be quite confusing. So let's clear up this confusion. In this webisode, we'll discover what eczema or atopic dermatitis really is. We'll discuss the very latest scientific theories as to the root causes of eczema and then talk about the latest treatments available for the eczema client. Atopic dermatitis, or AD, is a chronic skin condition. It causes dry, itchy, irritated skin that requires daily care. The word atopic comes from the word atopy, which means having a predisposition toward developing certain allergic hypersensitivity reactions, the key term here being allergic. Someone with asthma or hay fever would also be referred to as atopic. Certain types of antibodies, classified as immunoglobulin E, or IgE for short, trigger allergic responses in people. Atopics, like those with atopic eczema, carry more of these antibodies than do normal people. So they are already primed for heightened allergic responses. They may also have specific allergic responses to food, like peanuts, or other allergens, such as ragweed pollen. Most people, about 90%, develop atopic dermatitis before age five. Atopic dermatitis is not contagious, so there's no need to worry about catching it or giving it to someone. People who get atopic dermatitis usually have family members who have eczema, asthma, or hay fever. But there's another type of eczema that shows up as the same itchy rash, but does not involve allergic responses. This is known as non-atopic eczema. The same rashes on the skin may occur, but these people have a normal allergic response, not a heightened one. That is, they have normal IgE levels in their body. They don't typically have specific allergies to food or airborne agents, and they have normal immune responses. This form is more likely to develop in adolescence or adulthood, typically by the age of 15 years, and is more likely to affect women. Overall, this is a less severe form of the disease with more manageable symptoms. But take a look at these images. Could you tell whether someone is atopic or non-atopic? It's nearly impossible to tell just by looking. A thorough consultation can provide insights into the family health history, but in the end, it's still dermatitis. So however useful it may be to differentiate between atopic and non-atopic dermatitis, the end result is the same itchy patch of skin, and we must care for it in the same manner. So who exactly gets eczema? As of today, atopic eczema is estimated to affect at least 1 to 3% of adults and 10 to 20% of children in industrialized countries. In the U.S. alone, 6% of Americans, that's 18 million people, meet the diagnostic criteria for AD. In the U.K., up to 20% of school-aged children develop eczema, and 1 in 12 adults suffer from it. Eczema, along with asthma and allergies, is on the rise. In fact, atopic dermatitis is much more common today than it was 30 years ago, especially in children. It can even be considered to be a global epidemic, and this has significant economic impact. The rapid population growth is concerning, and may be due to many factors like pollution, inadequate diet, and other external factors. The truth is, we don't really know why it's increasing. Atopic eczema is a complex disease that involves the immune system, genetics, environmental factors, and even lifestyle. Let's look at the latest scientific theories explaining the causes of this complex disease. One single cause of eczema is not yet defined, which is why the disease is not yet curable, but is treatable. In simplest terms, the primary abnormality of eczema lies in a defective epidermal barrier. 
Numerous defects are found in the epidermal barrier of AD patients. A defective barrier allows penetration of potential irritants and microbes, which can exacerbate symptoms and cause inflammation. It also allows for exaggerated transepidermal water loss, which contributes to the dry and dehydrated skin associated with eczema. The modified barrier in atopic dermatitis is a highly complicated process that involves many factors. Let's consider some of the barrier differences between normal and eczema skin. Eczema skin is slightly more alkaline, with a higher pH than normal, which can alter the nature of the barrier structure, thereby affecting its function. In eczema, there is more enzyme activity, which degrades desmosomes. Desmosomes are the connections between keratinocytes. Think of them as the snaps that hold skin cells to one another. We still don't know why those with eczema have more enzyme activity or higher pH to begin with, but it is probably genetic. While these are internal factors that cause barrier breakdown, there are also external factors that can lead to a compromised epidermal barrier. Ah, there's nothing like collapsing into a freshly made bed at the end of a long, hard day. Warm blankets, crisp sheets, fluffy pillows. These are what make a safe, clean haven where you can finally relax. Or can you? Whether you like it or not, you never really sleep alone. House dust mites are common critters that are invisible to the naked eye, but can be found up to the millions on a typical bed. Yuck. The worst part is they live in your bed because they feast on dead skin cells. And those allergic to dust are probably allergic to the dead mite body parts and their excrement. To make matters worse, these mites can also secrete enzymes that chop away at the snaps or desmosomes. So you can see that someone prone to allergies and eczema is especially sensitive to these household companions. Other microscopic critters are also triggers for eczema sufferers. Skin prone to eczema often has higher numbers of bacteria, which alter the barrier integrity. Staphylococcus aureus bacteria secrete enzymes that cut away at ceramides, important components of the skin's natural moisturization factor and barrier lipid layer. So having more bacterial colonies on the skin means there are more of them chomping away at your ceramides, and that can leave your skin dry, tight, and vulnerable. You can see how both external and internal triggers can break down the integrity of the epidermal lipid layer. But why is skin afflicted with eczema different to begin with? Let's take a look at the role genes play in eczema. Genetic changes can bring out defects in skin cell differentiation. During differentiation, keratinocytes move from the basal layer of the epidermis through the granular layer to a group of flattened dead cells termed corneocytes in the uppermost layer of the skin, the stratum corneum. This process of epidermal differentiation is called keratinization. Different proteins are involved at different stages of epidermal differentiation. One of these proteins is called filaggrin and it plays a major role in eczema. Filaggrin is a gigantic protein expressed in large quantities in the outermost layers of the epidermis and has two main functions. First, it stacks the keratin filaments into dense bundles, allowing for easy desquamation. Imagine how much easier it is to store flattened boxes than propped up boxes. It is then converted into the skin's natural moisturizing factor, or NMF, along with other byproducts. We can imagine that if filaggrin does not work very well, it can have adverse effects not only on the process of epidermal differentiation, but also on the skin's natural moisture levels and the protective lipid layer. And this seems to be the case in dry skin. Recent research, primarily out of the University of Dundee in the UK, has made the genetic connection between atopic eczema, asthma, and allergies. These researchers found that a genetic mutation in the filaggrin gene caused the dry, flaky skin of ichthyosis vulgaris. Ichthyosis vulgaris is a common skin disorder passed down through families that leads to skin so dry and scaly it can resemble fish scales. 
Next, they found that filaggrin mutations were also a risk factor for developing atopic eczema, hay fever, and peanut allergies. Since some of this exciting research is very recent, just published this year, it brings hope for a future therapy, not only for eczema clients, but also those with allergies and ichthyosis vulgaris. So in fact, there seems to be a very real genetic link between all these conditions. Let's review. Internal factors affecting enzyme activity and filaggrin function combined with external factors, including barrier-disrupting microbes and irritants like soap, all contribute to skin barrier breakdown in atopic dermatitis, leaving behind itchy, inflamed skin. Now that we know some of the causes of atopic dermatitis, what can be done to alleviate symptoms? There are many options for the eczema client, depending on severity. These can be topical, oral, or light-based treatments. Corticosteroids, immune modulators, and retinoids are common topical treatments a doctor may prescribe. However common these, especially corticosteroids, have adverse side effects, which you can discuss with a dermatologist. Oral treatments in the form of immunosuppressive therapy, antihistamines, antibiotics, and even retinoids may also be prescribed. Doctors may also suggest either UVA light or UVB light as a phototherapy treatment for eczema. Most of these treatments target the eczema symptoms. Other treatments target the triggers that can worsen eczema. One of the biggest irritants to damaged skin comes from our own bodies, sweat. Excessive sweating can trigger or worsen hand eczema especially. Local tap water iontophoresis and even Botox injections have been used to treat the hyperhidrosis and dyshidrosis which can aggravate eczema. Dermatologists will use any of these methods to alleviate the symptoms of eczema. They may also do patch testing to determine whether someone is allergic to specific components of personal care products which can aggravate eczema. How can you, the therapist, help your clients with eczema? While there is no cure yet, you can provide the education and treatments that can control the signs and symptoms of this potentially life-disruptive disorder. Focus on calming, soothing, and definitely hydrating treatments, avoiding potential irritating ingredients and treatments. Because of the complexity of this disease, building in holistic therapies like reflexology, acupressure, and aromatherapy may also help in reducing stress levels which can trigger or aggravate eczema. The good news is that there are ways to manage eczema symptoms and gaining this knowledge will lead to more satisfied and educated clients. There are a wide variety of additional ingredients, usually preservatives, which can cause skin irritation or allergy, and it's best to avoid them for the eczema client. These are some of the ingredients that can aggravate eczema. The skin of people with eczema is dehydrated and sensitive. It is important to address this skin with a careful approach. As we mentioned, a cracked barrier will allow irritants to reach the sensitive layers below and cause a flare-up of AD. In the treatment room, if these cracks are open and evident, even water on the skin may sting the client. The best course of action is to prescribe anhydrous barrier repairing products and possibly the use of a soothing oatmeal compress. If the flare-up is not evident and the skin is not open, still proceed with caution. Our aim is to repair the barrier and reduce any inflammation and associated problems, so look for these ingredients to help with the eczema client. Also recommend titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. Physical sunscreens are best for an irritated, sensitized skin. Avoid chemical sunscreens. Coach the client on how to care for their skin at home. Remind them that although eczema has no cure, it can be managed. Here are some helpful tips for lifestyle changes. Establish a skincare routine. Following instructions is crucial for keeping AD under control. This takes a lot of time and effort. Avoid hot water as it can be drying. Instead, have daily baths in warm water. Use gentle, hydrating cleansers and avoid soap or high foam cleansers and bubble baths. Pat skin dry and apply a rich emollient moisturizer while the skin is still damp. 
Establish skincare as part of a regular daily life. Include skincare along with all other activities of daily living, such as brushing teeth or washing dishes. Next, recognize stressful situations and events. To cope with the stress in your life, you must first notice when and how often stressful situations arise. Find ways to de-stress with relaxation techniques or exercise. Other approaches may require expert assistance, such as a brief consultation with a psychologist. Be aware of scratching. Many people with AD scratch the most during idle times. Keep your hands busy with other activities to prevent scratching. And control your environment. Avoid irritants and allergens. Use fragrance-free laundry detergents. Invest in hypoallergenic mattress covers and pillowcases. We saw how our little friends love to call our beds their home. Protect your skin from dust mites. Clean your house and vacuum often to decrease dust exposure. Avoid low humidity. A humidifier can be a skin savior, especially in the dry winters. Wear cotton clothing. Wool and other fabrics can trigger itch and eczema flare-ups. Bleach baths may help with bacterial infection, while daily vitamin D intake can help boost immunity. Moisturize, moisturize, moisturize. Skin dries quickly, especially in low humidity climates. It is imperative to maintain hydration with topical products to make up for what the skin lacks. As you can see, eczema requires constant care, both professional and personal. Eczema is a complex disease with triggers stemming from genetics to our environment. As a professional skin care therapist, you can provide your clients with the necessary education for complying with your skin care regimen, as well as your technical expertise in getting and maintaining results for this very common skin condition. To find out more information on sensitive skin, log on to dermalinstitute.com. Thank you for joining me. To receive a copy of the notes for this webisode, fill out a short survey on the link provided.